Just like the shells can be split into subshells, the subshells can be split into orbitals. Subshells can have one or more orbitals. Um, how many electrons fit in a single orbital? Two. Two. We know that from organic chemistry or for other types of chemistry, two electrons per orbital. We oftentimes write that like this, right? Two electrons in an orbital. So how many orbitals are there in the S block? Because there's only room for two electrons. And how many orbitals are there in the P block? Um, just in the P, there's three. That would give us six electrons. Good. When you're ready, how many orbitals in the D block? Because that would give us 10 electrons overall. And how many orbitals in the F block? Because that would give us 14. So there are formulas that tell you how many orbitals there are in various shells and subshells. But you don't, shouldn't really need any formulas. You should be able to just figure it out from the number of electrons and the fact that we know that there's two electrons per orbital. Now we need to give names to the orbitals. We need to give names to the orbitals. And we need a new quantum number for that. Well, the quantum number for the orbitals is m sub l. Different orbitals have different m sub l's. By the way, this is why I think it's maybe not, it's a shame that this is called the orbital quantum number, because this is the one that actually tells you what orbital you're in. I don't know why this would be called the orbital quantum number if this is the one that tells you what orbital you're in. Uh, but the name for this is uh, something like magnetic quantum number. Where's my So m sub l is the orbital magnetic quantum number. So they got that word orbital in there. So in the textbook, they call that the orbital magnetic quantum number. The orbital magnetic quantum number. But it, what it really tells you is which orbital you're in. Or that, that's one of the things it tells you. All right, now the, the key for the m sub l's is that the possible m sub l's are always centered at zero. The m sub l's are always centered at zero. They're a series of integers centered at zero. So for example, um, let's say we're in the s block. How many orbitals did we say we need in the s block? Uh, one. So there's only one orbital, and it's called m sub l equals zero. It's called the zeroth orbital. How many orbitals do we need in the p block? Three. So we should have numbers, integers that are centered around zero. Yeah. So now we would say you're in the negative one orbital, or the zero orbital, or the one orbital. How about in the d block? How many uh, the d subshell? How many orbitals do we need there? to fit the 10 electrons. So what would be good numbers here? Negative two, negative one, zero, two. Right. All right. So again, we don't need really any formulas as long as we remember that the m l sub l's are integers that are centered around zero. And how many integers do we need? Well, you can figure that out from the periodic table. Since we know that there's two electrons per orbital, we need as many orbitals as is necessary to match the number of columns in the periodic table. And then how about when we're in the f? subshell, uh, how many electrons fit in the F subshell? 14. So how many orbitals? Seven. Right, so then our M sub L's would be? Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. Right. Okay. So again, I like to try to figure this out without using um, formulas. But the formula is, um, what would L be for S? Um, zero. And for P? And one. Sorry? One. Yeah. And for D? Two. And for F? Two. So you can see the pattern is M goes from negative L to positive L. The, po the possible M's, if you wanted a formula, would be from negative L to positive L. For example, when L is 3, it goes from negative 3 to positive 3. 
Uh, for my taste, again, I, I find that I have more intuition if I don't even use this, but I just say, I know there's going to be integers centered around zero, and I can figure out how many integers I need by counting how many electrons there are. But this is a good fact up over here as well. One thing to watch out for is um, your L can never equal your N, right? Your L can't equal your N, but your M sub L can equal your L. So you can't have N equals 3 and L equals 3. We saw that's impossible because L only goes to N minus 1. So this would be impossible. But could you have L equals 2 and M sub L equals 2? Yeah. That's totally fine. All right, so again, one of the most popular ways to write questions about this is to give you a bunch of quantum numbers and ask which ones are impossible. And it, it's easy to get confused and make mistakes. This is impossible, but this is fine. Because L goes from 0 to N minus 1. But M sub L goes from negative L to positive L. So this is fine over here. Um, how about this? Uh, well, no, I'll come back to that. All right, so uh, that gives us the possible m sub l's. This just tells us which orbital we're in. This is just a way of designating the orbitals. Now, this is not what we usually use in, say, organic chemistry. For example, how many orbitals are there in the p block? Um, yeah. Now, in organic chemistry or chemistry, what we would usually say is there's the p sub x, the p sub y, and the p sub z. We would just say the orbitals could be uh, oriented. So notice that what this really means is different orientations of the orbitals. These are orbitals that are oriented in different ways. Um, so in chemistry, oftentimes it's best to call them p sub x, p sub y, and p sub z, say. Uh, but if you use the quantum number approach, you would say this is the negative one-th orbital, this is the zero-th orbital, and this is the one-th orbital. m sub l equals negative one, m sub l equals zero, and m sub l equals one. These are just different ways of naming the orbitals. One thing that I think is easy to get confused about is the simplest case. If you're in the S block, there's only one orbital, and then M sub L is zero. I guess, for some reason, the simplest case can be the hardest case. So um, what's M sub L over here? Zero. Yeah, zero. When you're in the S block, the only possible M sub L is zero, um, because your L is zero. So negative L to positive L will just be zero. The easiest way to think about that is, obviously, the S block has two electrons and only one orbital. Well, if there's only one orbital and you want the numbers to be centered at zero, you've got to use the number zero. So is this possible? give you the possible m sub l's, and then the electron can be in any of these. After all, remember, suppose the electron is in the p sub x orbital. Well, we would call that the m sub l is negative 1, maybe. Or if the electron is in the p sub y, that would be m sub l equals 0. So these are the possible values for m sub l. You don't always have to list all the possible values. Um, so yeah, any of these values here would be possible. Any of these values would be possible. So is this a possible combination? No. No. How about this? Yeah, m sub l goes from negative l to positive l, but it can't be bigger than l. How about this? Yeah. Good. How about this? Uh, yeah. And this? Yeah. How about this? No. Now, now that we will see in a second, there is a type of quantum number that could be one half, but all the quantum numbers we've seen so far have to be integers. All right, so these are all possibilities here. It could be basically anything from negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Is this possible? L has to be less than n. Is this possible? No. M sub L can be negative, but L has to be 0 or positive. Can we do this? Yeah. Yeah. How many electrons can we fit in an orbital? Two. However, the Pauli exclusion principle says that you cannot have two electrons with identical quantum numbers. You can't have two electrons with identical quantum numbers, so there must be some difference between these two electrons, uh, even though they're in the same exact orbital. Well, the difference is their spin. It turns out that you can think of an electron as having a spin. 
Usually that's symboled by an upspin and a downspin. So that's the last and the fourth type of quantum number. Do you remember what the variable is that we use for the spin quantum number? M sub s for spin. M sub s for spin. Now in your book, they call that Sometimes the spin quantum number means something a little bit different. But anyway, this is indicating the spin. 